Good morning. Everybody's kind of coming on in. I'm going to say basically what everybody says in this moment. I hate to interrupt good fellowship. It's a common phrase, but you really do hate to interrupt it when people are having a good conversation. But we want to give Brother Dan all the time he needs this morning for class. We are so glad that you are here. If you're visiting with us, we consider you our honored guest. We hope that you will come back any opportunity that you have. Today our schedule is a little bit different. Uh, class at 9 o'clock or, well, a couple of minutes after. Uh, worship begins at 10. We'll have a meal together. We hope that you'll stay and be a part of that. I know there is plenty of food. Uh, so if you are a guest and you had other plans for lunch, just cancel them. And stay with us. Eat lunch with us. And then we'll have a, a worship service somewhere around the 1245, 1 o'clock time frame. Um, Brother Dan needs to get on the road. He's got another speaking engagement tonight. That's how in demand he is, which is awesome. Uh, we want to share him with anybody that has the opportunity to hear him. So uh, we're going to have our afternoon service somewhere around that 1245, 1 o'clock window. And I uh, hope that you'll stay all day with us and be a part of each of, of those things today. I do want to make you aware of one thing before we get started, then we'll have a word of prayer and then turn things over to Brother Dan. Um, just got a call just a few minutes ago from Miss Mary Ann Gann. Uh, Brother Wendell has been having some, some issues, some, some chest pains last couple of days. Uh, and she, of course, had been telling him he needed to go to the doctor. And he, of course, uh, as a typical man, said, no, I don't. Uh, well, he got up this morning and he felt like he needed to go on to the, to the hospital. Uh, and since arriving there, they've decided to keep him overnight just to make sure everything is okay. Uh, so if you will keep him and her in your prayers. Uh, Jack is on his way to her, should be there in the next 15, 20 minutes probably by now. Uh, so she does have somebody to come and stay with her. But, but be praying for them as they go through this trial the next couple of days to find out exactly what's going on and what's wrong. So I wanted to let you know about that so you could be praying about that. Uh, and we want to mention them in our prayers this morning. Anything else or any updates that we need to give at this time? Okay, if not, if you, if you will, let's bow. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll turn things over to Brother Dan. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to study. Father, we are so grateful for the help that you've given us to be here for the opportunity you give us to live in such a place where we have the freedom to worship, to study. Father, we are so grateful for your grace and mercy up to this point to allow us another breath, another life, another day of life on this earth. Father, we pray that we use it in a way that glorifies you. We pray that everything that we do this morning will be in accordance with your will, in accordance with your scripture. It will be pleasing in your sight. Father, we're so grateful for Brother Dan for what he represents, for all the good work he has done for so many years. Father, we know that, uh, that you are pleased by his, his efforts. We pray that you continue to give him good health, that he can continue to have a long life of service. Father, we pray this morning specifically for the Gann family, for Miss Mary Ann and for Brother Wendell. We pray that uh, their health issues may be resolved quickly, that if it be your will, they be returned to a, a most wanted position of health, that they can return and be with us. Father, pray for all the others that have been mentioned that are listed in our bulletin, those that are hurting over the loss of a loved one, for those who are dealing with upcoming surgeries, those who are recovering, those who are in the hospital. Father, those who are dealing with illnesses at home, we just pray that in each one of those situations that your peace be upon them, that you comfort them in a way that only you can, Father, and that you give us the opportunity to be there for them as their family, to surround them and to lift them up. We pray now as we study together, Father, we pray that you give us open minds, open hearts. As we open your word, we pray that we take the things that are taught this morning, apply them to our lives, and if we be found amiss in anything, Father, that we make that right with you this morning. We thank you most of all for Jesus, for his perfect example, for his perfect life, his perfect death, and that resurrection three days later. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody. We are studying Philippians chapter 4. 
And we began with verse 4 and we go through verse 9. And we are studying from this particular section in the book of Philippians to fulfill the assignment, the peace of Christ, a study of Philippians. Brother Dylan, where are you? There you are. Could I ask for your help this morning? Would you come up here and help me? Okay. Met Dylan on Friday night, fell in love with him as a young man, a hunter. He just, we had a good conversation over supper. I want you to help me here. Can you hold this book? Okay, one hand. Hold it with one hand. Now, I want you to hold it out like this. Hold it out here to the side. Out to the side. Now, hold it up. Hold it up. Now, just hold it there. How long can you hold it there? We're going to find out. Okay. <laughs> Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. And we want to begin reading with verse 4, and we're going to go through verse 9. Philippians 4, we'll start with verse 4. You okay? All right. No, 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 no. There you go. Don't cheat on me, buddy. Don't cheat on me. Straighten that elbow out. Okay, there you go. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let me read verse 6 again. How you doing? Okay. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praiseworthy, anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. The things which you learn and received, and heard, and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Let me remind you that we find in verse 7, the peace of God. And then we find in verse 9, the God of peace. Of the three times the word peace is found, how you doing? Getting heavy? Getting kind of heavy, isn't it? Slippery? It's slippery? Well, strengthen your grip, man. No, 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 don't move it. Just There you go. You're doing great. Of the three times the word peace is found in Philippians, two of them are in our context. And we learn that we can have peace from God because God is a God of what? He's a God of peace. And so we focused our attention to answer the, the assignment, the peace of Christ, on this particular section found in the book of Philippians. Let me remind you also, there are ten, or rather five, commands found in this chapter, or in this context. You watching him? He's struggling a little bit, isn't he? Uh -huh. What's this business? What's this business? Okay. Kind of hard. Why are you leaning? It got real heavy, didn't it? Just a psalm book? Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Hmm. Didn't he do a good job? You want to cry? I'm try? Do I have any takers? Do you know why I asked Dylan to help me to do that? It illustrates the point at hand. I remind you there are five commands found in our reading, really six, but one of the commands is referenced twice. Verse 4, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. That's a command, not an option or suggestion. Verse 5, you are to be known for something, in particular, gentleness. And then for our Bible class hour, we come to verse 6. And the third command of our reading, be anxious for nothing. 
Now, when we think about anxiety or worry, there are two things that flow into our hearts causing anxiety or worry. One of those is the past. And we take problems from the past, mistakes from the past, and we just bring them over into the present. And here are all the challenges of today, and those challenges of today themselves are noteworthy and demanding of our attention. But we put on top of all of those challenges for today the mistakes and the concerns we have from yesterday. Worry also comes into our lives from looking not only backwards, but from looking forwards. And we anticipate things that might happen. And so we bring all of those possibilities into our present. And so we take all of these things that happened yesterday and the concern of their bothering us today, and we take all of these concerns that we have for tomorrow and we pile them on the challenges of today. One songbook. And Dylan, and he's a young man, and he's a strong man, and he couldn't even hold it up to his side for 10 minutes. Nor can I, nor can you. This songbook represents your challenges and cares for today. Now, Dylan, would you like to come and put about three songbooks on top of that and let them represent yesterday? Would you like to put three more songbooks on top of that and just hold about seven of them right here? How long could you hold seven in your hands like this? Long time? You see, but that's what we do with our hearts. We take one songbook and we add bunches of songbooks from yesterday and bunches of songbooks from tomorrow and we pile them up there and we expect to carry them by our side on our backs all day long. And when the day is over, we wonder why we are so weary and we wonder why life is no longer full of joy. We've done that to ourselves. We have burdened ourselves with the imaginary mites and maybes of tomorrow and the mistakes of yesterday and we don't even have enough energy to concentrate on the day. Now when you look at Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 you read the words be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let the request be made known to God. Really, there are two commands in that verse, and we're going to look to the first of the two in our Bible class hour, and then we'll look at the second of the two in our worship hour, the one in reference to prayer. In essence, it says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. In our worship hour, we're going to talk about praying over everything. Now, worrying about nothing. As has been our modus operandi for our studies, we're going to do three things. We're going to focus on an interpretation of the passage, then a demonstration of the passage, and then an application of the passage, inviting what we've learned into our lives even today. So let's begin, first of all, with an interpretation of the passage of the command that we find in Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. I find in those few words, in that phrase, first of all, a command, and then a capsule. First, let's look at the command. It says, in nothing be anxious. Now that is an imperative verb, meaning it is imperative that, it is essential that, it is necessary that we be anxious for nothing. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is not giving us in this passage food for thought, suggestions for a better life, options to consider. In those words, the Holy Spirit is giving us a command to obey. How many of you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? 
because you are commanded to. How many of you have changed the way you have thought and changed the way you've lived in repentance? Because you are commanded to. How many of you have been immersed in water for the remission of your sins? Because you are commanded to. Equally so, in our passage, you are commanded to worry about nothing. Now be honest. I'll be the first. How many of us worry? Raise your hand. Ouch. But hold on a minute. We've been commanded not to do that. Am I right? But we do what we're commanded not to do? Go figure. I think this command deserves a little bit more study, don't you? It actually translates a verb that's in what's called the present tense. The Greek language was very, very distinct. Much more than the English language. And they would have verb tenses to carry nuance of thought. And one of them was the present tense and it carried the idea of continued action. So I'm reading a verb that's a command and it's in a tense dealing with continued action. And so actually what it says is this. Do not keep on worrying about anything. Let me say that again. Do not keep on worrying about anything. Now that present tense and that idea of don't keep on doing this helps me a little bit. It tells me that you know what? I am going to be prone to worry, to be concerned. But I'm not to keep on doing that. There'll be things to come into my life today that cause grave concern, furl the brow, weigh down the heart. But I'm not to keep on keeping on thinking about that to the point of worrying about it all day. Do not keep on worrying. That's the command. I can't keep the concerns from coming to my heart. Can you? Have you learned that art? To keep concerns from coming into your mind and heart. Can you, can you do that? But I can keep those concerns from taking over the heart. Somebody put it this way. I can't keep a bird from lighting into my hair, but I can keep him from building a nest there. I can't keep concerns, thoughts of concerns from coming to my mind. But I can keep them from staying there and taking over my mind and keeping my life captive. And that's the point we're finding here. Don't keep on worrying is the command. And then I see a capsule in the passage. You ever heard of time capsules? You have a bunch of stuff here today and you put it in a capsule and you bury it and 50 years later you come back and you, un, you, you dig it up and you open the capsule and you pull out all of these pictures and can you believe we wore our hair like that? Look at that. Polyester bell bottoms. That means very little to some of us but it means a whole lot to the rest of us. Amen? And so we put these thoughts in a capsule and we bury them and then we pull them out, open the capsule and we see what's been inside the capsule all these years. Now that's what I find in this passage. It says, be anxious or do not be anxious for anything, anything. Every facet of my life, any concern that comes to my mind, I am supposed to put inside that capsule and shut it up tight and not let it out. 
I'll have the concern, but I have a place for the concern. I put it in the capsule and leave it alone and do not let it captivate my life. So there's a command, don't keep worrying. There's a capsule about anything. If you've raised teenagers, you know what it's like to be concerned when they get 16 and they get a set of car keys. Amen? Somebody said, the terrible twos. Multiply that times eight at a driver's license and you really have something terrible. We know how to be concerned about our children, but we need not worry. Things aren't going well at work. I've got a boss that is from the other side of eternity, and I'm not talking about up, I'm talking about down. And he's making my life miserable. In nothing, continue to be anxious. Our marriage isn't all that it could be, all that it has been, all that we hope it will be. We're really struggling like right now, and, and in nothing, be anxious. Man, we're in a neighborhood and we got some neighbors that are horrendous and we wonder, is our property value going to go down and blah, 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 and in nothing be anxious. The stock market skyrockets. The stock market plummets. In nothing be anxious. I just retired. I'm on a fixed income. I have to live on a portfolio and look what's happening here, what's happening there, and in nothing be anxious. You can go everywhere with that. But regardless of the source of our concerns, the concern is to be put in that capsule and locked up tight. It is not to be allowed to captivate your attention and capture, hold your life uh, captive. Worry all the time about nothing. An interpretation of the passage. Now a demonstration of the passage. There is someone in the Bible that learned how to do that and do that well. Can you guess who that somebody was? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is an example of someone who learned to give his concerns to God and walk away and not worry about them. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we are going to find our Lord concerned. But we're also going to find that our Lord would not allow His concerns to evolve into something he constantly worried about. And we're going to see how he did it. Now, once you have found Matthew 26, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. We'll look at Hebrews 5 first and see what in reflection the Holy Spirit says about Jesus in Gethsemane. And then we'll turn and see Jesus in Gethsemane. Hebrews 5, read with me verse 7. Speaking of Jesus who, in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from the death, and was heard because of His godly fear. Though He was a son, yet He learned obedience by the things which He suffered. I want you to see what the Holy Spirit says about Jesus' actions in Gethsemane. It says, in the days of his flesh, this was while he was in his incarnate state, before he died, he offered up prayers and supplications. More on that in our worship service hour, but for the moment, the Bible has several words for prayer. If I observe this passage, he offered up prayers. The word translated, the esis, means the request of an indigent. I remember years ago, Diane and I 
were visiting with her sister and brother-in-law in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and we went to El Paso, and then we went across the border into Juarez, and we no sooner got out of our car into this beautiful little girl, long black hair, big dark eyes like saucers, just gorgeous. And she came up, and she the first gesture was she came up and she opened up her hand, and she began to beg. She wanted something from these gringos. She pled. And that illustrates the word diasis, to make the request of an indigent. Here I am. I'm impoverished. I have to beg just to exist. And I am pleading with God just to help me exist. And that's the word translated prayers. Jesus approached his heavenly father with the request of an indigent. Often in the Old Testament we read about lifting up holy hands. And this is a point just as a sidebar. We get all bent out of shape today over lifting up holy hands and, and, and singing like this. And I'm not an advocate of that. But I just, it, it, I'm curious as to how it's possible, not possible for us to do this, but at the same time, we got one man that's doing this. And I remember my daddy and some of his generation years back, they would stand up and they would really be in a song and boy, they were singing and they were doing this. You, you can't do this, but it's okay to do this. I can't put that together personally. But that set aside, that's not lifting up holy hands. You go back to the Old Testament, it wasn't something you did when you sang. It was something you did when you prayed. It was a posture of prayer. It was taking your hands and lifting them up, palms toward heaven, empty-handedly as if to say, I have nothing to offer. I am nothing without you. I need everything from you. And that is diasis. That's what Jesus is doing in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is extending the request of a beggar. He says he offers up prayers and supplications. And the word for supplications here is a word that means to, in its background, to extend an olive branch in search of peace. So he's pleading with God as a beggar. And from the core of his being, he's extending an olive branch of peace to his father, wanting something different than what needs to be. That's what's going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying. And he does so, it says, with vehement cries. Krauge. That's best illustrated by the sound of a crow cawing amidst the treetops early in the morning. Anybody ever hunted squirrel or gone out early in the morning and heard the coast cawing? You've heard it, haven't you? You want to come up here and tell me how a crow calls? I didn't think you did. See, you've had enough of that book, haven't you? Here's a sidebar. You ever notice you never find any crows that are run over and on the highway? You see armadillos, you see skunks, and you see possums, and you'll see a, a buzzard or a, a red-tailed um, hawk on the sides of the roads, but you never see a crow. You ever notice that? You know why? They take care of themselves. They, 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 they fly over and they say, car, car, car. <laughs> if you're a preacher, you go to school to learn jokes like that. Caw, caw. That's what Jesus sounded like in Gethsemane. Wow. With vehement cries and tears of the multiple words that the, he, the Greeks had for lamentation, tears, crying. The word that is used here is a word that means to cry on the inside. Internal weeping. He was ripped all to pieces. 
And he, he sounded like a crow cawing amidst the treetops early in the morning. As he is extending an olive branch of peace from his heart to God's heart, pleading with God as a beggar, and that's what's going on in Gethsemane. I wanted you to see that because when Jesus went to the garden prior to his arrest, he had concerns. We're talking about worry and not letting concern evolve into worry to the point of captivating our lives. So when Jesus went to Gethsemane, he had concerns. Now turn back with me to Matthew 26 and let's watch Jesus in action. I want you to see three things. He begins his evening in Gethsemane anxious. Then he takes his anxiety, his concern, and he asks something. He prays. And after he has takes, taken his anxiety to God by asking for something, he accepts God's answer. And from that point on, there is no concern. No more anxiety. No worry. Jesus is an illustration of what we've learned. Don't keep on being anxious. He goes, he's anxious, he prays, he's no longer anxious. Watch it happen. Verse 36, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, Olive Press, and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Literally, he began to be grief-stricken and very heavy. He's concerned. He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. I feel like I'm going to die. He was. But he felt like he was going to die right there from a heart attack in Gethsemane. He was so burdened. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, fell on his face, and now he takes his concerns, his anxiety, to God in prayer, and he asks for something. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, I find it interesting that he singled out Peter. I mean, there were three of them and they were all asleep and they were all heavy eyed, but he singles out Peter. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? It gets a little sharp with him. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you ever noticed that when your feelings are on edge, that you get a little quick with people? Wives, have you ever noticed that about your husbands? When things aren't going well at work, he comes home and he wants to kick the cat. Have you ever noticed that? Many of you ever noticed when things just aren't well whenever you come home from work and you know your wife's had a hard day and she's real quick with you at times. Have you ever noticed that? Don't, 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 don't shake your head. She's watching. Jesus is concerned here. He's heavy in concern here. And he gets sharp with Peter. Couldn't you watch with me one hour? What? And again, a second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words. And so he's making a request. He's asking things of God. Verse 45 says, He came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into his hands, into the hands of sinners. If you're not really careful, I did for years, you're going to read right over two key words in verse 45. 
the Son of Man is being right now betrayed. Now I want you to see what's happened here. Jesus went into the garden anxious. He had concerns. He got on his knees and he began to ask things of God. He went to God in prayer. And then after he had prayed, he got up and he said to his apostles, the time is at hand, the Son of Man is being betrayed. He could see, if you look at the parallel passages, this crowd coming, and he saw, he saw God's answer to his requests. God told him no. And he accepted the answer. He placed his life trustingly in the hands of God and never had a worry from that point farther. Not even on the cross. And I think, Father, why have you forsaken me can even be understood in line of not even having a concern or worry there. If you study Psalms 22 from whence it was quoted very carefully. Note, if you would, in the prayer, verse 39, he said, Let this cup pass from me. Note, if you would, in verse 42, in the prayer, he said, Oh, my Father, if this cup can't pass away from me. Now, take that to John chapter 18, verse 10. John's account of Gethsemane. Of course, the crowd comes. Jesus is being betrayed. And John 18, verse 10 Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Watch what Jesus says. Verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Take this cup away. Take this cup away. He prayed it again. Take this cup away. And here comes the crowd. Okay, I'm being betrayed. And now he says, I'm going to drink from this cup. Do you see the change? He went into the garden anxious. He leaves the garden with resolve. Why? Because he took his matters of anxiety to God in prayer. He was anxious. He asked. He accepted. And there were no more worries. You know what we do? We take our anxieties to God in prayer. And then we get up and we carry them with us, don't we? We don't leave them there, do we? An illustration and then our application. Young lady went to college, very spiritual. She put in construction paper on the wall letters that spelled out the words... Let God. And she would get on her knees and she would look at her sign and then she would turn around and she would pray and she would let God have control of her life. She was having a bad day. And so she came back to her dorm. She looked at her sign, let God. And she got on her knees. She began to pray, but she just couldn't get in the mood and she just couldn't give things to God. And she just was having a struggle and she stood up, didn't even finish her prayer, opened the door, walked out, slammed the door behind her, Later came to herself, walked back into the dorm, closed the door, got on her knees, and as was her custom, before she tried to pray again, she looked to the sign, and one of the letters had fallen off the wall. And the sign no longer read, Let God. The D had fallen off the wall, and the sign read, Let Go. You know why you worry? Continually? You're not letting God have the problem. You won't let go. Ladies and gentlemen, God will not play tug of war with your problems. You pick up one end of the rope. He picks up the other end of the rope. He begins to pull You resist, he lets go. He's not going to play tug of war with your problems. 
So either you try to handle them or give them to God. And if you try to handle them, get ready. Life's going to be tough. But if you want the peace of Christ, then you give the problem to God and let it go. And get ready to be amazed at to what God can and will do. So here's an illustration or demonstration of not continuing to worry about anything. A man that learned to trust God with his problems. Turn with me now in application to Luke chapter 22. I understand that you're studying the book of Luke and as these wonderful concepts of Jesus are brought to light, you're looking through this particular book. And I was asked to look at Luke 12 verses 22 and following and this is about anxiety. So I want you to read with me these words of Jesus and see what Jesus in application says to us in our efforts to not continuing to worry about anything. If you like to mark in your Bibles, first of all, underline the words, verse 22, do not worry. Then come down to verse 29 and underline the words, do not seek. Then come down to verse 32 and underline the words, do not fear. You have in these particular words Jesus teaching us how to address the stress in our lives. And I guess if we were to put a a title to our thoughts, Thursday night it was rejoice, it's a choice. Last night, be gentle, it's a fundamental. And for this particular lesson, we might say, properly address the stress of your life if you want the peace of Christ. To address the stress of life, Jesus tells us to do two things. First of all, revisit, write it down, your value. You mean something to God and He's going to take care of you, don't worry. Number two, Jesus says, revisit your values. What's important to you? A lot of times we worry because our values are grounded rather than heavenward. Watch now. Rethink or revisit your value. Verse 22. He said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry. Again, It's the same construction as we have in our passage of interest, Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't keep on worrying about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than the food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider, literally think down on, think down on the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which have neither... Uh, and ha- which have neither storehouse nor barn, God feeds them of how much more value are you than the birds. Is that children getting ready? Okay. So if God takes care of the heirs of uh, birds of heaven, will he not take care of the heirs of heaven? Consider the lilies of the field. Think down on those lilies. They neither toil nor spin. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Allegapistoi, O you of little faith. Believe in God and know that you're valuable to him and he's going to take care of you. Why worry? And then do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Don't fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell what you have. You want to know whether you're worried or not? Think about what you're going to give in the next hour. Think about what you do with your possessions. If you were asked to sell and give, what would you sell? So you could give. Would you go find the coat that has the holes? Would you go buy a brand new one? Sell what you have. Give alms. 
Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens. And then verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Revisit your values and trust God. God said in Malachi chapter 3, put me to the test. You give to me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and shower blessings on you so you can give even more to me. We literally keep ourselves poor rather than give ourselves rich because our values are so out of sync with what the Bible teaches. If you want to overcome worry, revisit the fact I am valuable to God. He's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry. And I am going to revisit my values. I'm going to give to God so that He will give back to me so that I can keep giving to Him so that He can give more to me and I'm just a conduit of His blessings to the world. And I shift my whole heart away from living here for me to living for Him up there by being a blessing to everyone around. So Jesus, an illustration of someone who in nothing would be anxious and someone who teaches us how to do the same. Remember, worry is the dark room where the negatives of life are developed. Remember, worry is a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. So, in nothing, be anxious. Thank you for your attention. We look forward to thinking about prayer here in the next hour.
Good morning. Good morning. Alex, you can sit down now. It's great to see everyone. If you are visiting with us, please come back any opportunity you do have. There should be uh, cards on the back of the pew in front of you. If you would fill one out, put it in the co collection plate at the appropriate time. Uh, that would be great. It's been a great weekend, and don't you love this sunshine? It just makes you feel better just seeing the sunshine, does it? I have a few announcements I do need to make. If you did not get a bulletin, please get one. Uh, I will not read uh, everything in there. I'll try to go through most of the things that are important, but if you would please get a bulletin and, and keep note of that um, and remember those uh, that are sick that are in the bulletin. We have Miss Sheila and Mr. Frank's a great granddaddy again and Miss Sheila's a grandmother. Brittany, Brittany had a little, Brittany Turner she is now. She had a baby boy, Finn Beckham. Ooh, eight pounds and 11 ounces. Good healthy boy. Congratulations to Mr. Frank and, and Sheila. We got a call this morning that Brother Wendell is in the hospital. He was having chest pains for the last three days and, and uh, Miss Miriam finally convinced him to go and he drove himself to the hospital this morning. So he, uh, they're gonna keep him overnight and the doctors are gonna check him out tomorrow. So let's do remember him. And uh, Miss Marianne's grandson should be with him, uh, with her. He was on his way up to stay with her. We have Miss Vada here with us. I was going to announce she's home from surgery, but she's back with us today. So be careful. She's got this big arm. Don't say anything to her. She might knock you back. No, actually, actually, uh, Mr. Glenn said he was glad it was a soft cast. So whatever that means, you can take it for whatever you want to. We are sad to announce that, uh, and I've announced this earlier, Miss Vivian Cleo Riggs, she's the sister of Miss Faye Stewart and the aunt of uh, Randall Tucker and James Fleming. She passed away on Friday. Funeral will be today at two at the Rogersville Funeral Home, and the visitation will be before that from 12 to two. So let's do remember that family. We also want to express our sympathy to the family of Bill Johnson. It's a stepfather, Mark Preck, and I do believe his mom is with us today. So let's do remember those in our prayers. We have the Magi Project. It's in the bulletin, the details of it. Please support that. If you have any questions, see Donnie and Kim Lane. They are heading that up and can provide you all the information you want. The bulletin does have most of it in there as well. Graduation recognition is going to be May the 20th. That's coming up. So let's remember uh, those graduating and keep them in our prayers. A lot more stuff in the bulletin. Please take a look at and, uh, and keep up with what's going on with the church here. I have, you know me, I love quotes and I love poems. So I have a poem I want to read before we have our first song. It's called Just One. One song can spark a moment. One flower can wake a dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can herald spring. One smile begins friendship. One hand clap lifts the soul. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame a goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh will conquer gloom. One step can start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will raise your spirit. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. You see, it's up to you. Number eight, six, seven. Number eight, six, seven. After this song, we'll have a reading and prayer. Eight, six, seven. <clears throat> 
To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear-dim eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. All roses blooming there for me, where the soul never dies, and I will spend the Beams across the foam where the soul never dies. It shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim eyes. I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul never dies, where there will be no parting hand and the soul never dies, no sad. Take your Bibles. The scripture reading this morning come from Psalms 116. We'll read the complete chapter. Psalms 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my, my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Verse 9. That I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay I said, all men are liars. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice the thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us and you bless us every day. This morning we want to come to you and say thanks. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for showing us mercy and forgiving us. Thank you for the material blessings that we enjoy in this life. But most of all, Father, we want to thank you for your son and his sacrifice on the cross so that we can have hope of eternal life and a home in heaven with you. And this is why we're gathered here this morning as your children 
to worship you, to sing praises to you, and to rejoice in Jesus. And it's his name that we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper has been prepared. Let's sing number 176. 176. To prepare our minds. 176. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty son and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. Sacrifice the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ the Lamb of God. I was so long. I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Let's pray. God, as we stand around your table this morning, we're mindful of your son's body that hung upon that cross that was beaten, spat upon, and all this was done for us. We're thankful for that sacrifice we made. Let's remind us to go back to remember this bread represents that body. We pray that we never forget that sacrifice. It's through Christ's name. Amen.
Let's continue our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and the blood that he shed on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice for the remission of our sins. Father, as we take this emblem now, we ask that you continue to watch over us and guide us always in your way. And we thank you so much for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for everything that you give us in this great world we live in and the means we have to go out, to use our hands and our minds to make a living for ourselves and for our family. And we pray that we never forget that ability you gave us and we always give back a portion which is all yours anyway, just through Christ's name. Amen. Number 587, 587. We'll sing the first and last verse. 587. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through. There's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep. 
keep your soul at home. Be faithful, look to Him and pray. Lift your voice and praise Him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair skies. When it seems the fortunes of earth crown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust Him who leads you, He will keep your soul and on. Be faithful, look to Him and pray. Lift your voice and praise Him in song. Sing be happy today. Number 827. 827. 827. <coughs> Sweet heart of prayer, sweet heart of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne and makes my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul. I'll stand and sing number three. Number three. Number three. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah from the heavens. Praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise. stars on high. Praise Him, all ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise His gift, Jehovah, for His name alone is high, and His 
glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established his decree shall never stand from the earth oh praying Jehovah all ye floods ye dragons all fire and hail and snow and vapor stormy winds that hear him call let them praise his gift Jehovah and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great judges all, praise his name, young men and children small, let them praise his gift Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory Good morning. Just want to take one moment for those that may be visiting with us, make two quick announcements. One, we hope that you'll stay for lunch. Uh, there is plenty of food provided, so please, please cancel plans that you may have already had. Come on and stay with us and eat lunch with us as soon as services are over this morning. Uh, we will also have a afternoon session, so please stay for that as well. By way of introduction, uh, if you've been here all weekend, I guarantee you will say that you have been blessed. I know that I have. Uh, for those of us that have been here each, uh, each night, it has been a true joy and a true blessing. For those of you that were here this morning for the Bible class hour, uh, certainly uh, an incredible lesson presented there. Uh, Brother Dan Winkler, many of you know him and have known him for many, many years, has been preaching. Uh, I went and checked my numbers. It's almost 50 years now. I said 40 plus, and it's getting close to 50, which is amazing. Amazing, amazing track record of service. And we are so, so glad that he has been with us this weekend and so proud of the good work that he is doing, uh, both as a member of the Huntington Church and working part-time sort of as a full-time fill-in at Spring Meadows uh, where Dell Jenkins is the pulpit minister. So we are so glad that you are here to be a part of our study, which has been over Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And uh, we look forward to the, the message this morning and also this afternoon. So Brother Dan, come speak to us. It has been my joy to be with you, and I'm so thankful we can continue our study of Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Several years ago, I was laid up with a broken ankle. In point of fact, the right side of my right ankle has a plate and about five screws, and the inside of my right ankle was so crushed, it just had to wire it back together. I wish I could tell you it was for some uh, great philanthropic means that I fell and broke my ankle, but actually I broke it playing on a slip and slide with grandchildren. It was done in September, and I found myself laid up all the way through the following March. And it was toward the end of that uh, time of getting better 
that I went through something called physical therapy. Raise your hand if you've ever done that, physical therapy. I walked in, the first time I did so, my physical therapist made this statement. She said, P-T, that stands for pain and torment. And she lived up to her word, I'm here to tell you. I told her, I said, you are my physical terrorist. And there would be times that I would just have to say, oh, oh, that hurts so good. You know the feeling? Because it would hurt and yet it would help. It was in those sessions that after she would work with my ankle and my leg that she would take this gadget and it looked like an electric pad, a heating pad. And she would wrap my ankle in that heating pad. And then she would turn it on and she would begin to adjust the settings and I could feel these slight impulses, just a little bit. She said, how's that? I said, well, we could go a little more. And so she would crank it up and, and those pulses would get stronger and, and she would go all the way until my leg began to jerk and then she'd gone too far and she could bring it back. And then once she had it at the right setting, she would leave me there for quite some time. And so that ankle was totally encapsulated by that pad. And every now and then, there would be a soothing pulse. And a soothing pulse. And a soothing pulse. And that's the word picture we find in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Read with me, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And, mark it, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind or thoughts through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. The things which you learn and received, and heard, and saw in me. These do, and mark it, the God of peace will be with you. Verse 7, the peace of God will guard you. Verse 9, the God of peace will be with you. The word picture that is set before us in those two phrases marked of interest is the idea of a God of peace totally encapsulating our hearts. And then as the need arises, like that pulse, like that pulse, like that pulse, peace from God makes its way into our lives, allowing us to enjoy the rich life that a Christian has in which to rejoice. In our reading, there are five imperatives, essentials, five things necessary to live as a Christian. We're directing our attention and our studies to those five imperatives. One actually is mentioned twice, the first of the five. Do you want the peace of God? Do you want peace from God? Do you want the peace that you can have in and with Jesus? Listen to the imperatives, the commands. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. And so Thursday night we learned that to have peace from God, we must rejoice. It's a choice. Command number two, verse five. Be known for something. And that something is specified. 
you be known by all men for your gentleness. Some translations say forbearance. Some say reasonableness. The idea is I am willing to yield my feelings for your feelings. I'm willing to live with a meek, kind, gentle spirit towards you. And thus, be gentle. It's a fundamental we learned last night. Command number three, verse six, be anxious for nothing. Or as we saw in our Bible class hour, don't keep on worrying about anything. So if I am to know the peace that comes from God, the peace from a God of peace, the peace of a relationship with Christ, I must properly address the stress of my life. But now we come to command number four of the five with the last one being studied as we return in our afternoon session. The fourth of the five is also found in verse 6 when it says, Make something known to God. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. The imperative, the essential, the necessary thing, the command is make this known to God. And so has been our course of action and study. We will continue by looking at, first of all, our passage interpreted, an interpretation of our passage. What is actually meant by this command? Then a demonstration of this passage. And then an application of the passage to our lives. First of all, very briefly, let's look at an interpretation of the passage. It says, let something be made known to God. Now, we saw last night that the Greeks had two basic words for to know something. One is oida, and that means a knowledge that is complete. And one is ginosko, that's a knowledge that's ever going and ever building and uh, continuing to grow. And we observe in this passage that it is the latter of the two. We are to continue to make things known to God. Now pause with me for a moment. Why do I have to let God know what my requests are? If I go back to Matthew chapter 6, I remember that Jesus said, Your heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you even ask. And the word know there is oida. Your heavenly Father already has a completed knowledge of everything you need before you even ask for it. So, why ask? Why make the request? Why constantly say, I'm going to bring this to God's attention? It's not because my heavenly Father needs me to ask. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because I need to ask. It's not because my Father needs to be made aware of what's going on in my life. I need to be aware of my heavenly Father knowing what's going on in my life. In short, I am commanded to pray because I need to pray rather than God needing me to pray. I need to learn that I am dependent on the care of God and therefore I take my cares to God. Do you remember 1 Peter chapter 5? Cast all your cares, anxieties upon Him. Why? Can you help me? Why? He cares for you. That's what I'm reading in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. I am to make my request known to God. Not because he doesn't know them already, but because I need to know I must give my cares to the one who truly cares. I have to learn the process of I can't make it in this life without him. And so the command is you 
Learn you need God and therefore pray. Now, as I look at this passage, an interpretation of the passage gives me a command. And the command is to continually make my requests known to God so that I can know I need Him. Also in this passage, I see a communication process that is to be employed for making my request known to God. It says, In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The communication process, as specified in this passage, is threefold in nature. I am to make my request known to God, first of all, by prayers. Now, of the many words for communicating with God, this word is prosuke, and it simply means to communicate with deity, talk to God. I am to make my request known to God by simply talking to God. The communication process. I think that's very important. Because in reality we have turned prayer into more or less a formal gesture. In which we employ special words and key phrases. Such as, bless the sick and the what? Afflicted and all for whomsoever it is. Our duty to pray. Or we thank thee. We ask thou. And we employ the archaic pronouns. Thee and thou. I remember on one occasion years and years ago. My brother who preaches over in Madison. And I were worshiping with our father. In a lecture program where my father was to preach that evening. And they asked both of us as his sons to lead prayer. I was to lead the first and my brother right under me was to lead the second. And so I got up and I prayed. And then uh, after my daddy preached, my brother prayed. And then after the services, this big old burly guy, he had to have been six foot five if he was six foot at all. He came up to me and he stuck out this baseball glove size hand and he wanted to shake my hand. Well, I put my puny mitt in his and he says, I like you. Well, thank you, sir. And then he says, you're a thee and thou man. And I didn't realize that in my prayers I'd said thee and I'd said thou in talking to God. You're a thee and thou man. And, and Sometimes I wonder if we feel like we have to use archaic pronouns and make prayer a a formal gesture. I've even heard it said, use thee and thou in your prayer because the archaic pronouns express reverence to God. For whom? If for you, use them. We live in a generation where that doesn't express reverence for God as much as it once did. And generations are coming along that don't talk that way. I don't go to my wife and say, What hast thou prepared for lunch today? I thank thee for this good meal. I'd have Quaker Oaks for breakfast, I think, because that's the way they talk. Persuke simply means talk to God. And so when I am making my request known to God because I know I need God, I am first of all to just talk to God. If I'm walking down the street, talk to God. If I get up in the morning before anybody in the house even knows I have opened my eyes, talk to God. If I'm driving down the road, talk to God. Eyes open preferably, talk to God. And don't make it a formal gesture. He wants to hear from me as his son, as his daughter. He wants me to talk with him. When our sons call on the phone, they don't use archaic pronouns. They don't use uh, canned phraseology. When they, they don't talk anymore, they text, right? 
And I've never seen our sons text the words thee and thou. And they never use can phraseology. We just talk. And that's the word translated prayer. Talk to God. I'm not sure I know how to do it right, Brother Dan. Doesn't matter. Talk to Him. In everything by prayer and supplication. Now the word supplication in this passage is deasis. And it's that word that means to make the request of an indigent. To beg. So sometimes I just talk to God. And then there are sometimes I literally beg God. He may say no. He may say yes. He may say wait. He may say I'll give you more. He may say I'll give you less. But I am to beg God at times. I can beg God while I'm walking down the road. I can beg God when I'm on my knees. I perhaps, like you, might even be in a fetal position groveling on the carpet floor below. But I beg God for things that I need in my life. And that's how I make my request known to Him and learn from the gesture, I need God in my life. I'm talking to Him and I'm begging Him for His involvement. And then there's this third means of communication with thanksgiving. God wants to be lifted up. God wants to be praised. Question, do you praise when you pray? If you don't, try it by yourself you will find it awkward. Keep stepping out of your comfort zone and continue praising God when you pray and make it a part of your communication with the Almighty. It will do wonders to your spirituality. And so in this passage, an interpretation of the passage gives us a command. Make your requests known to God, not because He needs to know, but you need to know He's involved in your life. And then the communication process specified, just talk to Him when you do it. Beg Him when you need and praise Him in the process as well. An interpretation of our passage. Don't you find it interesting that this is coupled with the previous command? Don't worry Keep worrying about anything, but pray about everything. Now a demonstration of our passage. Let's turn to one who knew how to do that well. Take requests to God. Turn with me, if you would, in your New Testaments to Luke chapter 22. And we will focus our attention on Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when He prayed. While you're turning, let me remind you of what we read in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Jesus is praying. His disciples watch. And when He finishes, one of the disciples says, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, help us do it. That way, if I could go back in time, and if I were allowed just one opportunity to step into the life of Jesus and watch, I have a particular time that I would want, to which I would want to return. I think it would be neat to watch him turn water into wine and watch everybody's eyes just become silver dollars. Wow! How did this happen? But that's not what I would want to go see. It would really be cool to be in the boat and see Jesus come walking on the water, wouldn't it? I don't think I'd do Peter's job. I, I, Lord, let me come out and try that too. But it'd be kind of neat to watch Jesus defy gravity and walk on water, but that's not where I'd want to go. I could not. I, I can be honest with you. I could not go to the shadows of Calvary. It would be just way too difficult 
for me to see because I know I did that to that man. If I could go back in time to just one spot in the life of Jesus, it would be the Garden of Gethsemane. I would want to watch my Savior pray and be enriched by watching him and the way he did it. As we read Luke 22, beginning with verse 39, let's focus on Jesus as a demonstration of one who took his cares, his requests, to God. Let's see what he did before he prayed, what he did during his prayer, and what happened after his prayer. First, what he did before he prayed. Luke 29, 2, verse 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. Ethos, habit, as was his habit. The Mount of Olives would be on the eastern slope, or on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, there was a garden, and that garden was called the olive press because it was a garden full of olive trees and it was, it's known to us as Gethsemane. And Jesus would very frequently with his apostles or without go to the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. He would leave the city. He would cross the, uh, the Kidron Valley, which was a dried up riverbed, and he would climb up a part of that eastern slope of the Mount of Olives and he'd go into that garden known as the Garden of the Olive Press, and that's where he would pray. And here's what I want you to know, first of all, from what Jesus did before he prayed. He had a special place. Do you remember Matthew chapter 6? Jesus talks about going to your secret place and in secret pray to your Heavenly Father. Do you have a secret place? It may be in the car when you're driving to work by yourself. It may be an easy chair early in the morning before anybody wakes up where you sit down with a glass of water and you just talk to God and sip from your water glass. It may be like my father-in-law prior to his death. He had an old chicken coop that he created, became a dog shed, and then ultimately it became his secret place. Rain, snow, sleet, or shine every morning. Before anyone got up, he made his way to his secret place. And there he communicated with God. Jesus had a secret place, a special place. Next, Jesus wanted private time. He went there, verse 39 says, with his disciples, they followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them a stone's throw. The Greek is far more emphatic here. There's the word withdraw, which means to draw away from. The Greeks did not have what we have today. Typing on a computer, you can hit command B and you can begin to type in bold. Or command I and you type in italic. Or command B and command I and you type in italics bold to just really emphasize a point. He, they couldn't type and, and hit the control key or the, 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 the uh, capital key and type in all caps. And so the Greeks had a way to emphasize a point. They would say something twice. And a lot of times they'd have a verb and they'd put a preposition on the front of that verb and then they'd repeat the preposition to put an exclamation mark behind the meaning of the verb and that's what we have right here. He drew away from, away from. The word for away from is used twice in this context signifying the desire Jesus had for some private time. He had a special place and he wanted to Talk to God in private. Then third, look at his posture. He went a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed. Now Mark tells me he fell to the ground. Matthew tells me he fell 
on his face. Later in Luke, I learn he prayed more earnestly or more literally stretched out. Watch his past posture. He falls to his knees. He falls to the ground. He falls with his face in the sands of Gethsemane, groveling in agony. And he finds himself totally stretched out, pleading to God. And that's his posture. Here is a man that is making his request known to God. He had a place, he had some private time, and he, look at his posture. There's some things I can learn there. I need a secret place. I need some time when I talk to God by myself, not for or with someone else. And there may be some times that I find myself groveling in agony as it was with Jesus before he prayed. What about during his prayer? This man who made his request known to God, watch what he said. I can learn some things. First of all, he spoke to God as a father. Verse 42, he knelt down and prayed saying, Father. Now if I read Matthew's account, he prayed, My Father. If I read Mark's account, he prayed, Abba, Father. Abba, Aramaic, for a very tender expression that might best be translated, Papa. Father, oh, my father, Papa, father, he talked to God as a father. I am speaking to God Almighty, yes. I'm speaking to the creator of the universe, yes. But outside of the word God and outside of the word Jehovah or Lord, God is called Father more in the Bible than anything else. And I need to learn that when I'm praying. I am a child of God and I can talk to Him as my Father. And He wants to know what's going on in my life from my perspective that He already knows. When He prayed, He expressed feelings. Father, oh my Father, Abba Father. There were feelings in his prayer. Do you say your prayers? Or do you speak when you pray? Do you say your prayers? Or do you express your feelings when you pray? Has there ever been a time when you prayed and you couldn't express your feelings? And according to Romans 8, the Holy Spirit takes over and helps you express your feelings to God with words that cannot be uttered. Express your feelings talking to your Father. And then while he prayed, he prayed with deep faith. If it be your will, not my will, but your will. If it has to be your will, your will be done. He's praying with great faith. Mature is the individual Christian who can pray and make a request to God and then say to God, I'm willing to accept whatever you decide. And it can sometimes be extremely difficult to trust. Before he prayed, during his prayer, what happened after he prayed? After he prayed, he received strength. Verse 43, an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And the word strengthened there is the idea of having ability on the inside. We would say enabled. An angel came and enabled him. When I pray, I need to know. The angels are waiting. We don't talk about this enough. 
in our reactionary theology, packing away from Pentecostalism and the fear of believing in miracles, we're afraid to even think about the idea of the supernatural involved in a natural way in our lives. But Hebrews 1.14 tells us that angels are ministering spirit sent forth to minister to those who will inherit eternal salvation. There are angels all around us. And they are ministering to our needs. Well, what do they do, Brother Dan? Don't have a clue. Where are they, Brother Dan? All around. Have you ever seen one, Brother Dan? No. How do you know they're there? I've been told. I've been promised. And that's all I need to know. Amen? I can be strengthened by the knowledge. I make my request known. And Jesus Christ dispatches angels into this unseen realm of providence to address my need. And that enables me to take another step forward regardless of what I'm experiencing. After he prayed, he was strengthened. I'm afraid we have to keep going and can't stop there because after he prayed, he continued to be sad. I need to remember that too. Even though I take my concerns to God, when I get up from my knees, everything is not hunky-dory. I can still be struggling with my thoughts. Verse 44 says, And being in agony, agonia, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, stretched out. And so he continued to be sad, making his request known to God. And then after he prayed, we see a sense of, a solitude. He felt alone. Went to the disciples. They're asleep. Couldn't you watch with me one hour? Went back and prayed. Came back to asleep again. Never was our Lord more alone. Save as he hung from the cross. So before he prayed he had a place. For private time with God. And he engaged in a variety of postures. Remember. When he prayed, he spoke to his father, expressed his feelings, and he prayed with great faith. And after he prayed, he was strengthened, but he was still sad, and he felt alone in solitude. Some things that I might be alert to and know will come my way, even with prayer. And so we see our passage demonstrated in Jesus. An interpretation of the passage a demonstration of the passage, and now an application of the passage. Brother Dan, help me with my prayer life. I want my prayer life to be stronger. I want to learn how to talk to God better. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And as we very briefly consider how to strengthen our prayer lives, I want you to look with me at verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. While you're turning, is it not interesting to you that 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Do you know what the verse right before that says? It's the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament. It's translated, Rejoice always. Wow. Here they are together. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. You want the joy of Christianity, the peace of Christ? Learn to pray to God about your life. Now to help us with our prayer lives, 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 says, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Four kinds of prayer referenced in verse 1. Supplications, begging God, making the request of an indigent. Prayers, talking to God, as mentioned earlier intercessions, falling in with the requests of other people, talking to God about the lives and challenges of others, and then thanksgiving or praise. Here are some suggestions for applying these concepts of prayer to our lives. 
suggestion number one. Break your day into quarters and have four special prayers that you pray every day for one week. In the first part of the day, pray with supplications. And in your first prayer, you're begging God for things to take place in your life. You don't thank Him for one thing. You don't talk about anybody else, but you plead with God about something that you need or want in your life. The second time you have set aside for prayer, just talk to God. Lord, it's a beautiful day. It's just, I'm so glad we have this day to live. Talk to him about the sunshine that he gave us today. Talk about the beauty of the dogwoods that he's created. Talk about the sparkle of the sun on the lake around. Talk about the fish that you caught yesterday. Talk about the great meal that you're going to have. Just talk to God the second time you've set aside for prayer. The third time in the day you've set aside to pray, Talk to God about other people. You don't mention yourself one moment. Talk to God about other people that you know who are struggling with life and ask God to involve himself with them. And then the fourth time you set aside for prayer, let that be a time when you praise God. You're not going to ask him for one thing for yourself or anybody else. You're not going to talk to him about one thing except his greatness. How awesome he is. And use that prayer to be nothing but a time you praise God from whom all blessings flow. So set aside four times in the day that you pray four different kinds of prayer. Another suggestion. At times, pray a prayer and let this verse serve as the outline of your prayer. And so for a while, you're going to ask God for some things. And then you're just going to talk to God for a while. Then you're going to talk to God about others for a while. And then you're going to finish up by praising God for the awesome God that He is. Let 1, Peter chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 be kind of a springboard for your prayer life and for your prayers. He was a little boy that had never been taken to Bible school. And so he was on his knees and he began to pray. And this is what his prayer sounded like. A, B, C, D, E. A man walked by. He said, saw the boy on his knees. He said, son, what you doing? And the boy said, mister, I'm saying my prayers. Well, why the ABCs? He said, sir, I never was taken to Bible school. I don't know how to do this. And so I thought that if I said my ABCs, God would take the letters that he needed to spell the words that I meant, and everything would be okay. A little boy who believed in prayer. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In nothing be anxious, and yet we're worry warts. Why? Maybe it's because the latter part of that verse we're failing in also. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Do you believe in prayer? Jesus began his instruction on prayer by telling us to pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. God is the Father of a special group of people. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, see if he's your Father. Your sons, children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus, because as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. When I have a faith, a Bible-based faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son that moves me to be baptized for the taking away of my sins as instructed in Scripture, 
Then God is my Father, and I have the joy of speaking to Him on a regular basis in prayer. Do you believe in prayer? Is God your Father? Questions you need to ask and answer as we stand together and sing. When my Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When my Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will if my robe is white when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. You all look great. Thank you so much, Brother Dan. What a tremendous job this morning. Thank you for encouraging us and educating us and preparing us for service to live by faith. And that is what we're about, honoring uh, our Lord Jesus. We're going to uh, enjoy a meal together. And I know that you'll have opportunity during that meal to uh, come up and meet Dan and Diane uh, they will be with us, and then immediately after lunch, we'll be meeting back here. Uh, so we hope that you'll go and refuel and come back and be ready. Uh, it's a great day for us to be together. We've got a lot prepared. Please stay and, uh, and be our guest uh, today. We are really thankful for that opportunity uh, to share in that together. So we'll look forward to it. Uh, we're going to sing, and then we'll have somebody lead closing prayer. Number two, three. We'll sing the first and last verse. Two, three. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tent disguised with heavenly hue and friend the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From the stars.
you, God. Thank you for this day that you've given us to come out here and worship you and help the people that are overseas fighting for freedom, hope for them a safe return to their families, Lord, and be with the food that is prepared for us. And thank you for the hands that did prepare it for us and let it nourish our bodies and let us take what we've learned today from this lesson and use it in our everyday life. And thank you for your son and our cross for our sins. In Christ's name, amen.